All right. Now in Acts chapter 16, I need to point out something real quick from Acts chapter 15. I misspoke last week when I was preaching. I mean, the whole sermon was, was mainly about, you know, being the circumcision and everything like that. But I misspoke in regards to Titus. And I, had, I think when I was preaching, I was just getting Titus confused with Timothy. And if you look back in, um, in chapter 15, and it says, um, what verse is that now? I should have written it down. It basically said that neither was Titus compelled to be circumcised. And for whatever reason, I'm not seeing it right now. But what I had, what I had said, and I, and I was thinking right after I preached, I was thinking like, did I say that? Right? And I went back and I listened to the recording and, and I said it wrong. Titus was not circumcised. It says he, neither was Titus compelled to be circumcised. They were trying to compel him to be circumcised. The people in that area, that's, that's what the whole argument was about. That's why they went down to Jerusalem. That's why they did all this stuff. But, but he did not get, get circumcised. But what we see here, after that whole ordeal, after that whole you know, mess of, of them sending him down to Jerusalem and, and um, going to the apostles about that matter, it says, um, it says in, in chapter 16, in verse 1, it says, Then came he to Derbe. This is after Paul and Barnabas split. So Paul and Silas now go to Derbe and Lystra. And behold, a certain disciple was there named Timotheus, the son of a certain woman, which was a Jewess and believed. But his father was a Greek. So here you have Timothy, right? Um, Titus and Timothy are the, the epistles that are written later that Paul writes to these two young men. Uh, we see Titus in chapter 15. We see Timothy in chapter 16. Now, Timotheus was, he was born, his mother was a Jew, but his, his dad was a Greek. And everybody knows this, right? Everyone knows that, like, oh yeah, his mom's a Jew, but his dad's a Greek. So it says, which was well reported by the brethren that were at Lystra and Iconium. Him would Paul have to go forth with him. So Paul wants Timothy to come with him. Paul wants him to go out with him and, and, and preach and, and learn and, you know, and just to come with him to the work. It says, and he took and circumcised him because of the Jews which were in those quarters, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. So they knew his dad is a Greek. They basically, like, his dad was not saved. His dad was an unbeliever. His dad was a, was a Greek. Um, not that all Greeks were just unbelievers, but what it what it's, teaches here in the context is that basically by him being a Greek, you know, his dad was unsaved, but his mom was a Jew. She believed. And Timothy believed. So Paul has him circumcised. And um, it's amazing how this happens. Like, Paul goes on and on, and, and you look through the epistles of Paul, too. I mean, he is dead set against circumcision, and he said, you know, circumcision is nothing, uncircumcision is nothing. We went through a bunch of those scriptures last week, but then we see him here, just a short time later, circumcising Timotheus. Now, I think God does this on purpose. He wants us to see these things. Now, it's important to understand, first of all, that just because somebody that is a great man of God does something and it's recorded in the Bible, it does not make it a good thing just by default. You can't just say that, well, well, Paul did it, so it must have been right. I mean, that's what people say, like, oh, well, you know, King David had multiple wives, or, you know, Abraham had a concubine, so it must have been right. No, they sinned. They were not supposed to do that. That's against God's law. Good men do bad things sometimes. And we need to keep that in mind, and you can't use that as an excuse. And a lot of times, it's easier to try to justify your own actions, your own sins, and say, oh, well, you know, Abraham did this, or Paul did this, so it must not be that bad. You can't have that type of an attitude, because I think God puts us in a reason, it puts us in the Bible for a reason for us to understand that these men are just men. They're human. God does not want any individual human being get it, getting lifted up above that that he ought to be lifted up to. You know, um, all of these men are servants of God and they're all sinners. Every single human being has their faults and every great man of the Bible, you're going to find where their faults are listed as well as their great qualities. Now, I mean, their great qualities are usually way far above the amount that you read about than their shortcomings, 
right? I mean, you, we, we did the study on the Apostle Peter. Amazing things he did. I mean, he was a great, a great man of God, a great disciple, a great apostle, did all kinds of great works, yet he had his shortcomings. Moses had his shortcomings. David has his shortcomings. And Paul had his shortcomings. Nobody is immune to succumbing to the pressure of, of you know, outside forces of, the, of people that are going to be against you. I mean, and that's what, actually what happened here. Paul succumbed to the pressure of the Jews that were in those parts. He knew, they, they knew his father was a Greek, and they were going to be, you know, coming down on him for bringing someone with them into ministry to do this work that wasn't circumcised. Paul already knew it was wrong. But he, he apparently had a weak moment, and he circumcised Timothy. And, and it's important for us to understand, that was not right. I mean, it's very clear throughout the Bible that there's no, re no reason that he should have done that. And... Um, I mean, you were thinking, he was just withstanding Peter to the face, like in the previous chapter, no, which is not that much time-wise before these events took place here. Obviously, there's a little bit of time to travel and stuff, but it's not that much time has gone by no, before he ends up circumcising no. Timothy. He withstands Peter to the face because he was to be blamed, because he was succumbing to the same pressure of the Jews when he wouldn't eat with, with people from another country, when he wasn't eating with the people, um, with the Gentiles. And... And Paul's rebuking him. Well, now Paul's doing the same thing. And, um, you know, again, it's important just to understand that just because Paul does this doesn't make it right. It wasn't right for him to do that. And we see the shortcomings here, and everybody's got shortcomings in the Bible. But just, under, just remember that as you read the Bible, that just because someone does something, it doesn't mean that, that it's okay. Let's keep reading. Verse number four. And as they went through the cities, they delivered, for, for, they delivered them the decrees for to keep that were ordained of the apostles and elders, which were at Jerusalem. So they gave them those decrees earlier after they went down to Jerusalem and saying, you know, that people should keep themselves from fornication and things offered idols and all those things. So they're going around in the churches and they're, and they're kind of saying, okay, look, these are all good commandments for you guys to follow and you'll do well if you follow them. So they're going around and they're delivering those decrees. And then in verse 5 it says, And so were the churches established in the faith and increased in number daily. And see, they're going back and visiting the churches that they had already helped get started. And now they're going back, they're confirming them, they're visiting the people, and they're getting established in the faith and they're increasing. So the churches are growing. They're doing a great work. They're growing in number. It says daily they're growing. They're, they're increasing. Verse number 6. Now when they had gone throughout Phrygia and the region of Galatia and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia... After they were come to Mysia, they essayed to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. Now, these are two interesting verses here because you see here the Holy Ghost. They're, they're, just, they're going around and they're preaching the gospel. They're visiting churches, right? And they're also preaching the gospel and doing God's work. And here's two places where the Holy Spirit says, no, don't go there. And at first glance, you look at that, and I was, you know, even reading this, I'm thinking like, wow, like, you know, there's nothing wrong with going soul winning. Right? Nothing wrong at all. I mean, they're preaching the, the word, they're doing God's work. But there's actually places here where God just said, no, I don't want you to go there. And, um, and to me, that's just, that's just pretty interesting that, that that even happens. But there's a couple different reasons I could think of as to why this would be the case. One, God had a plan for what they needed to do. Right? I mean... There's two people here. You have Paul and Silas, and you know they probably brought Timothy as one of the few people, right? There's only so much work they can accomplish. God has the path laid out that He wants them to take. So even though, sure, preaching the gospel is doing a good thing, right? God wants God wanted them to come and and do a specific task, and He had the plan laid out for them. So He's like, no, I want you to follow what I have laid out for you. But I was thinking about this too. I mean, I don't know what what these these cities or areas were like in that time. They may have been terribly wicked. They may not have been. I don't know. I don't know anything about that. I don't claim to know. And I don't also claim to know God's reasons for forbidding them to go there. It's not, it's not clear. It's not explicit in, in the Bible. But it is clear that they were told not to go there. And God had good reasons for it. And as I said, we could think that maybe one good reason is just because God already had a plan. He knows where he wants them to go. And he says, hey, that's where I want you to be. It's not over here. But I was also thinking about this, 
And something else that we can take away from this is that there are places that even if you are going to go out soul winning, that you probably ought not to go and do it. I mean, one place that comes to mind just right off the top of my head is, is like going to a bar, right? I mean, there's certain places that you just shouldn't be going to anyways. You could say, oh, but I want to go. And, and you can have the best of intentions and say, you know what? I want to go. There's people there. They need Christ. They need the love of God. They need to hear the gospel, right? And you say, no, they're, they're lonely. They're sad. They're depressed. Their life's in the gutter or whatever. You want to go in there and I want to preach to these people. But I'll tell you what, as a Christian, you ought not to do that. Now, for one, there's lots of other places you can reach those same people. They're not in there 24 hours a day. At some point, they have to go home, right? And you can meet people out. And that's why we go door to door. Because the whole point is to try to go out and reach people at their home. Because almost everybody in this country has a home to go to, right? And we're going to try to reach them there. And then the others that don't have a home, we're going to have to try to reach some other way. Right, we have to meet, meet wherever they are, on the street or, or somewhere, wherever they happen to be. But there's places where we ought not to go, even though you might have a good intention. Right? I mean, like you should never walk into like a strip club or something and be like, oh yeah, well I'm going to go in there and preach the gospel. And get this no, no, that's wrong. And um, that's not necessarily exactly why the Spirit was telling them not to go here, but I just thought it was a good, a good point to be able to bring that up and say, you know, let God lead you and direct you in, um, in the path that he has laid out for you. It's not always easy. You're not going to hear a voice telling you like, okay, now go right. Okay, now go left, right? <laughs> but you're going to have this, this spirit guiding you. And um, it's kind of hard to put into words, but if, you're, if, your heart's, if your heart's in the right place, you're doing the right things, you're reading the Bible, you're... you're, you're you're completely willing to do what God has for you to do. You might not even realize it at the time, but he'll end up making it clear to you. He'll, he'll can cause circumstances that come up to kind of guide you and lead you different ways. Um, as long as you're, as you're just willing to do whatever it is that he wants you to do. And that's the way that, that attitude that we ought to have. So um, let's continue reading here. We're going to keep moving on. I just, I just want to throw that because it's, it's interesting that, that, the, that the Holy Ghost is even saying, like, don't go over there. Right? Don't preach the gospel there. Oh, I, need, I got something else for you to do. But in verse number 9 here, and here we see a vision. You know, Paul receives visions. Now, I honestly have never received a vision before, but there are, you know, the apostles uh, were getting visions from God and kind of instructing them on what to do. And again, I think when, the, when God was revealing his word unto them and the New Testament, that, you know, like when Peter uh, received the vision of the animals coming down from heaven, those are kind of special events. Those are kind of special things that happen. It's not, I don't believe that something that's going to happen in every Christian's life, you know, where they're just going to be seeing all these visions. Now, I'm not saying people can't get visions from God because the Bible talks about even in the last day that your, your, um, your young man shall see visions, your old man shall dream dreams, and, and there's prophecies like that in the Bible. So um, I'm not saying it can't happen or, or won't happen again. But it's not something that's just a regular part of every Christian's life. So here we see in verse 9, it says, And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. And after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. So this is what they're using basically as their sign. Say, oh, we saw a vision. This guy's in Macedonia saying, okay, we're going to head towards Macedonia. The Spirit already was guiding them not to go into these places in Asia. So they're saying, okay, we're going to go to Macedonia. So this is where they're going in verse 11. It says, therefore, loosing from Troas, we came with a straight course to Samothracia and the next day to Neapolis. And from thence to Philippi, which is the chief city of that part of Macedonia and a colony. And we were in that city abiding certain days. So they make it to Macedonia. They make it to a... One of, the, one of the biggest cities of Macedonia here in Philippi. And again, these places should look familiar to you when you think of Philippi. Paul writes a, an epistle to the Philippians, right? Um, Timothy and Titus, he writes epistles to them. We see Gala we saw Galatia and Phrygia, you know, the, the epistle to the Galatians. So in Acts, we're seeing all the places that they go that Paul later will write epistles to those churches. Um, 
So anyways, they're here in Philippi in verse 12. Now verse 13, it says, And on the Sabbath day, we went out of the city by a riverside, where prayer was wont to be made. And we sat down and spake unto the women which resorted there. So there's this place where I guess these women would always go, and that's where they would go to pray unto God. So they go out there, and they sit down, and they, and they resort. They, they start talking with these women there that were there to pray. And it says, And a certain woman named Lydia, verse 14, a seller of purple, of the city of Thyatira, which worshipped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened, that she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. And when she was baptized in her household, she besought us, saying, If ye have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. And she constrained us. Now, this woman either just got saved and got baptized, or she was already saved and got baptized. It says that it says she worshipped God and she heard us, and then God opened up her heart. And she attended those things which were spoken of Paul. So it's hard to say definitively whether or not she was saved before, but it's not that big of a deal for the story. Basically, she gets baptized by Paul, and she's like, okay, look, I want you to stay with us. Because they just arrive in a flip. I mean, you got to remember the apostles, when, when these guys are going out, it's not like they have places already predefined to stay. I mean, it's, they're, they're, they're completely just on the road, and they're just going around and just trying to do whatever it is that God has for them to do. So it's not like they've made reservations at hotels in advance and they're they're going out there and they're, they've got a place to stay they're just going out and just doing whatever god has for them and then and then you know if people will receive them into their house great you know that's what they're looking for so they stay with this woman lydia now look at verse 16 it says and it came to pass as we went to prayer a certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination met us which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying the same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. And this did she many days. But Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. Now, people might look at this and say, Well, what's the big deal? She was saying stuff that was good. Right? I mean, she was just saying stuff that was like, you know, these men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. There's nothing false about that, right? I mean, that's it's just saying the truth. These are good, these are men, that they're men of God. But, um, <laughs> see, the problem here is that in verse 16, it says that um, she was possessed with the spirit of divination. Now, is that, does that sound like a good thing to be possessed? No. Absolutely not. It's never a good thing to be possessed. People get possessed with devils. Now, it says here is a spirit of divination. So you can look at that and say, like, oh, well, that sounds like it's a good spirit, right? But it's not. It says, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. That word soothsaying is very important to understand what that is. Um, in Micah 5.12, I'll read this to you. The Bible says, and I will cut off witchcrafts out of thine hand, and thou shalt have no more soothsayers. Soothsaying is very closely related with, with witchcraft, with enchantments, with wizards, with, with all of these things that are, that, are, that are complete wickedness and the Bible commands us not to be involved with and not to do. The Bible calls, do you guys remember Balaam? Balaam the son of Bosor? Balaam was the, was the, the false prophet. He was hired to, um, to preach, to, to curse the children of Israel. Balaam was the one, he was riding on his ass. And there was, a, there was an angel from the Lord in the way that was going to kill him. And the ass like stops, he like turns to left, and then he like crushes him against the wall because, and just, just basically stops. And then Balaam gets really mad because he's like, why are you, you know, like, why are you doing this? And he, and he whacks him, and he hits him, and then the Balaam, and God opens up the ass's mouth, so he talks, so like Balaam's ass talks back to him. And um, I don't know if you guys remember the story or not, but it's, it's really good you should read it. Um, and his ass tell him, like, why? You know, like, I've never done anything wrong to you. Why are you hitting me? You know, like, there's an angel in the way. And, I, and I'm, you know, basically he was protecting him. And then um, Balaam's eyes were opened up to see that the angel was there was going to kill him. But anyways, regardless of that story, if you don't remember, fine. But Balaam was a soothsayer. The Bible calls him a soothsayer. He was a false prophet. He's also referred to, I think it's either in, it's either in um, 2, Timothy, or 2 Peter 2 or in Jude, uh, referring to Balaam being a false prophet. And um, 
it says that he used enchantments and um, and he was a soothsayer. Not a good person. Now, sometimes these people will say things that are right, but that still doesn't make them good or what they're doing good, and it definitely doesn't make being possessed a good thing, right? The Bible says that the spirit of the prophets are subject unto the prophets. God does never just controls you or possesses your body in the way that, like, you're just saying and doing things that, that he's just in total control over and you have zero control over. Now, you should be walking in the spirit and being led of God, but we always have the willpower and, and the ability to where we're in the driver's seat and we can make decisions and choose and do whatever we want. But when a person is possessed of the devil, when they're possessed of a devil, they're not in the driver's seat. They, they end up doing things that are just, I mean, they're possessed, right? Possessed means literally like... like if this is my possession, this belongs to me, I own it, I, I have it, right? I control it. But when people are possessed by a demon or a devil, they're being controlled because they're in possession of that devil. Of the, basically, their body is in possession of them so that, that the devil is able to control them the way that he sees fit. So um, the Bible also says, talk about enchantments here, in Leviticus 19, verse 26, the Bible says, You shall not eat anything with the blood, Neither shall ye use enchantment, nor observe times. And in verse 31 it says, Regard not them that have familiar spirits. Neither seek after wizards to be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. So again, you see enchantments, wizards, familiar spirits, soothsaying are all, are all interrelated. It's all essentially the same thing, witchcraft. This is all stuff that the Bible condemns. The Bible says to put wizards to death. It says to put witches to death. I mean, these are things that are serious in God's eyes. He says just completely stay away from it. Now, how does all this apply today? Well, these people are still around. You might not know them as soothsayers. You might not know them as wizards, right? But what about the people that are called psychics? Or, you know, the fortune tellers or the people who read tarot cards? Or the astrologists, the people are really big into astrology and the horoscopes and all this other stuff. It's all wickedness. It's all witchcraft. That is what the Bible is referring to of people observing times. That's the people looking at the stars and doing their astrology and trying to get all this wisdom from the stars. That, um, that's wickedness. The Bible says not to do that stuff and not to be involved with that stuff. And it's not something you should even joke about and say, oh, ha, ha, yeah, we're just going to go. I'm just going to get my fortune read. I'm going to say, I'm going to say, read my palm or whatever. Don't have anything to do with it. It's extreme wickedness. You know, um, God put the death penalty on people that did that. You should, you should have nothing to do with people who have familiar spirits. And, you know, it might seem amazing. And people get sucked into this because they'll see things and they'll hear things and maybe they'll be able to, to, to be told things that no one else would be able to know. But this person can, this psychic can. And the reason why they can do that, if they're legitimate, and there's a lot of charlatans out there, there's a lot of people that fake it, and it's just all about the money, obviously. Okay? But I believe that there are people who have familiar spirits, that people that are possessed by devils, and devils are spirits, they're you know, the fallen angels, there's people, these spiritual beings are able to go around and they can hear conversations that maybe you think no one's around but there's a devil there. You can't see them physically with your eyes. There's a spiritual warfare going on. I mean, we read about Michael the archangel battling with these devils, right? And battling with Satan and these, and these events happening in other times past in the Bible. There's spiritual warfare going on. We read about the story in, in um, I believe it's first, yeah, first Samuel where... Um, you know, the prophets being, being, Samuel's protected by a whole legion of angels. You know, there's this whole army come to get them, and, and they're protected. And they're protected by spiritual beings. And um, these, these beings exist. They're real. So some of these psychics, I believe, are being possessed by these devils, by these spiritual beings that have the ability to go out and know things that... that really no one else should know about people because they can see them and they can hear them and they can see things that are going on. So people get, get sucked into this because they'll hear this stuff and they'll say, oh, it sounds good. 
But, um, but it's not something that we should have anything to do with whatsoever. Because it's all, it's all just going to be deceit and lies anyways. But even if they were to say something that sounds good, like they did here with the, you know, with the apostles who said, oh, well, they're just saying that they're men of God, right? And that they've come to show us the way of salvation. With that specific statement, there's nothing wrong with that. But the Bible already said that she was, her masters made much gain by soothsaying. And soothsaying is a very negative thing in the Bible. It's something that you ought not to have anything to do with. And you think about, um, you know, the woman was literally possessed. It's, and that's what the Bible says, she was possessed. We see other people possessed in the New Testament in Matthew 8, 28. You don't have to turn it. I'll read this for you. The Bible says, And when he was come to the other side into the country of the Gergesenes, there met him two possessed with devils coming out of the tombs, exceeding fierce, so that no man might pass by that way. And behold, they cried out, saying, What have we to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God? Art thou come hither to, to torment us before the time? The devils that, that possess people, they know a lot. Of, they know, they're not stupid, right? They knew who Jesus was. They knew exactly who Jesus was. And we see in, in multiple accounts where they're, they're falling down, like in Mark 3.11, it says, And unclean spirits, when they saw him, fell down before him and cried, saying, Thou art the Son of God. And again, is there anything wrong with them saying, Thou art the Son of God? Well, I mean, it's, that's correct. They were true. It's right to say that. But it says, And he straightly charged them that they should not make him known. And um, even again in Luke 4, 41, it says, And devils also came out of many, crying out and saying, Thou art Christ, the Son of God. And he, rebuking them, suffered them not to speak, for he knew, for they knew that he was Christ. And um, so we see in this story, right, there's this woman. She was possessed. She was a soothsayer. She brought her masters a lot of money, a lot of gain, because of that trait, because she was a psychic or whatever. And she would, people would come to her pay her a bunch of money, and she'd tell them or forward their fortune or whatever. She would soothsay for them. And um, we see here that these devils, they know Jesus Christ. They say things sometimes that aren't bad, that aren't you know evil in, the, in and of themselves, just like what was happening here. She was following Paul around and just saying, look, these men are going to show you salvation and making these proclamations and stuff. And then it says that Paul just basically gets grief. He's just like, I've heard enough of this, you know, and he just commands that the spirit... Leave that woman. He, just, he commands the name of Jesus Christ, get out of her. And he did. And, and the apostles had the power to do that type of thing. They had the power to, to cast out devils and to get rid of these familiar spirits, these unclean spirits. So that's what happened. So now we're going to see the result of that in verse 19. It says, And when her masters saw that the hope of their gains was gone, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace with the rulers and brought them to the magistrates, saying, These men, being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our city and teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe, being Romans. So here we see they're upset because their money has gone now. There's no way that, that their daughter is going to be able, or the, you know, this woman's going to be able to um, soothsay anymore. The, the spirit's gone from her. She's not going to be able to do the same things that she was doing before. So they see this, and it was probably a very lucrative job, obviously, um, that they, they had these gains. So they're like, and it's because of Paul and Silas. So they get irritated. They get mad about this. So what do they do? They just start making stuff up because they know there's no way that they're going to be able to get them in trouble for telling an unclean spirit to come out of her. I mean, the, I'm sure there was no law against them doing that. So what they do is they say, they bring them before the magistrates, and they say, these men being Jews, so notice that they point out the fact that they're Jews, saying, these Jews do exceedingly trouble our city and teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe, being Romans. And this is going to be like, like probably one of the only place you're going to find Roman persecution of the apostles. Because all throughout the Bible, we see that the Jews are, are, are stirring the people up, and getting people against the apostles, against the disciples. Now here we see that, that them being Romans, but you see their motivation still, it wasn't because they were Christians, it's because they were losing a bunch of money. I mean, that's what they cared about. They didn't care about their doctrine or anything else, they just cared that, hey, you just cost us a ton of money, so now we're going to go get you in trouble. That was the real motivation. And then it says, And the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into the prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely. 
who having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stock. So they get beat bad, right? I mean, it says they have many stripes. They're bloodied, they get beat up, they get thrown in prison, they're like, keep them safe. So when the jailer gets that charge, he says, okay, not just throw them in a regular prison cell, he's going to put them into the innermost prison, and he's going to shackle them up inside of the jail cells. So he says, I'm going to keep them safe. Verse 25, and at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. And amen to that. That's, that's, you know, every time they're getting beat, they're always have full of joy. They're always rejoicing. They're always just saying, and think about that. When you get beat down in this life, are you full of joy? When, they, when bad things come and happen to you, they were receiving physical beatings. They were thrown into a, a, the innermost prison, and they were shackled up. No freedom, nobody, just stuck in a prison cell, and they're singing praises unto God. That is incredible to me. That is the type of heart that we all ought to have and the type of love that we ought to have for God. Instead of having the, the complete opposite attitude and being like, oh man, why is everything just wrong happening to me? Why am I in prison? Why can't, you know, I'm just trying to do what's right, God. Why can't you watch out for me? Why can't you take care of me? That's not the attitude they had at all. They don't charge God foolishly. And, and the contrary, they actually rejoiced. They sang praises and they prayed to God. And, and they were doing this at midnight. I mean, it's the middle of the night. And they're, and they're singing praises and praying to God. But see, because they have such a great attitude, because they're doing these things, I mean, they're full of faith. God is, is opening up the miracles to them. Verse 26, it says, And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bands were loosed. Everyone that was in the prison there, all the prison doors just open up. There's this earthquake. All the prison doors open and all their shackles just, just, just come off their hands. Obviously a miracle. I mean, you might have in an earthquake some of the doors opening and getting smashed and broken and stuff. But you're not going to have everybody's bands just, just coming off their wrists. They're coming off their legs, right? Wherever they're shackled up. And just everybody's free and all the doors are open. And see, that's what God is capable of doing. When, you know, I believe this is a picture of salvation, right? Worse, you're shackled, you basically are in bondage to sin before you get saved. But when God saves you, hey, the shackles come off, the doors are open, and you're completely free to go. And it's open for everybody, um, anyone that wants to receive Christ. And um, it says in verse 27, And the keeper of the prison, awaking out of his sleep, and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. So again, I mentioned this a week or two ago, how um, we saw earlier that the, the keeper of the prison was examined when Peter got out, and, um, and they were put to death. This guy probably would know he'd be facing a similar situation since he was on duty and everybody's gone. And he just woke up, too. I mean, he was sleeping. He just wakes up and he sees, wow, like all the doors are open. He just assumes everyone's just gone because why wouldn't they be, right? If you were in prison and all the doors are wide open, you're going to be hightailing it out of there. But, um, so he's about to kill himself. He's about to fall on his own sword. And it says in verse 28, but Paul cried with a loud voice saying, do thyself no harm for we are all here. Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling. So this guy's scared and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Now, I don't believe necessarily that this, that this prison guard is asking them what he has to do to be saved from going to hell. Now, we use this verse a lot. I use this verse like every single time I go out soul winning because it's extremely powerful because it's a great question and answer. Now, I think that since he was about to kill himself, and because all the doors are open and he's in this position, and he's the one responsible, he's thinking, what do I need to do to be saved? Right? I mean, like, like this, is a, this is a bad situation for him. But how they answer him is the reason why we even use this when we go out soul winning. Because they answer him in the spiritual sense. Now, we don't know exactly for sure what was going on in his mind when he asked a question. If he's asking about his, his soul going to hell or not. But their answer says what they said, you know, what, what they were thinking. 
It says, and they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. They gave him the spiritual answer. They gave him the important answer of what he needs to do to be saved. And this is why we use this verse out of soul winning because the guy does believe. He does get saved. It says in verse 32, and they spake unto him the word of the Lord and to all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the, of the night and washed their stripes and was baptized, he and all his straightway. So the guy believes, he believes with all his house, he gets baptized, right? And they, they give him this clear statement of what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's it. And that is the answer for salvation. But, um, so, you know, we see, excuse me. A lot of, I used to think that maybe like this guy, you know, the jailer heard them praying and singing because it says all the prisoners heard him. But he didn't awake out of his sleep until the earth, until all the doors were already opened up from the earthquake. So I don't necessarily think that's the case that he that he heard them. And but no, he probably didn't know why they were in prison. He probably knew that they were that they were you know apostles and that they were preaching Jesus Christ. So um, I don't know. I mean, you can decide what it is, but to me, it doesn't even matter because their answer explains it all. Their answer, and, and obviously there's so many other scriptures that back that up. It's not just this one place in the Bible that says that, that gives a requirement for being saved. But we love, we, you know, I love using this verse just because it's so laid out clearly and explicitly. Now, I point this out again last week that it says that um, he was baptized in all his straight way. So, I mean, this guy believes he gets saved and right away he's getting baptized. And I believe that is the best thing for a person to do once you be believe, once you get saved, hey, as soon as you can, get baptized. Don't put it off. Don't wait for any reason. There's no reason to wait. Just do it right away. Get straight away. Just get baptized. It says, and when he had brought them into his house, he said, meet before them and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. So he's, you know, he's giving them food. He washes their stripes. He cleans them up, right? He's happy. They're, um, you know, he gives them some food. But then I, I just think this is super funny because, I mean, this guy gets saved, he washes his stripes, he gives him food to eat, but then it says in verse 35, And when it was day, the magistrate sent the sergeant, saying, Let those men go. And the keeper of the prison told the saying to Paul. So basically, he brings them back to jail, right? I mean, they're like, like, in order for Paul to, to preach the gospel to all of his house, the guy brings him home, right? I mean, all the prison doors are opened up, everyone's shackles are loose. He brings them home, he gives them some food, he cleans them up. You know, they're, they're there, he baptizes them. Right? I mean, can you imagine being in prison and like, like, I can't imagine being in prison, getting the jailer saved, going to his house, he gives me some food, you know, I baptize him in his pool or something, and then he's like, all right, guys, come on, it's time to go back to jail. You know, like, <laughs> but that's what happened. Right? This is what happened in the story. But um, so he brings them back to jail. And um, so we see here, and, and we're almost done, we're wrapping up. And the keeper of the prison told this saying to Paul, um, the magistrates have sent to let you go. So these guys, they whip them, they beat them, and they throw them in jail. They lock them up overnight, right? And now they're just saying, okay, yeah, send and just, and just set them free. Just let them go, right? So there's total police brutality, total just, they just, they just abuse them. You know, they don't, they didn't do anything wrong. There was just these railing accusations made against them. They get all upset. They beat them up. They whip them. They just think, oh, these Jews, we're, we're going to show them something. We're going to throw, you know, we're going to beat them up. We're going to whip them. We're going to throw them in jail. And then we'll just let them go. Because they had no legal standing in the case at all because they didn't do anything wrong. But I like what Paul says. Look at verse 37. It says, but Paul said unto them, they have beaten us openly, uncondemned, being Romans, and have cast us into prisons. And now do they thrust us out privily? Nay, verily, but let them come themselves and fetch us out. Paul says, uh-uh. You better come out here yourself and, and come and get us out of here. We didn't do anything wrong. We were uncondemned. You beat us openly before everybody. See, Paul, Paul was not some spineless coward. He was not some guy that was just always submissive to the government, is doing everything that the government says, as a lot of people will have you believe that we need to be as Christians today. That's a bunch of hogwash. That's not true at all. Now, is politics or fighting the government our main fight? No, of course not. It wasn't their main fight either. But when these things happen, when you do come into brushes with the government, with the law, you don't just cower down and back down and just do whatever it is that they say you're going to do. 
He knew he had rights and he called them out on them. He was being vocal about his rights. And, he, and he, he said, look, I'm a Roman. You know, because the Romans, they just thought that he was a Jew, which, which would have been a little bit, you know, like not quite as many rights as, like a, as a Roman would, a, a Roman citizen. But they think, you know, but he was, a, he was a citizen of Rome. He was a free man. Now, I also don't believe that the government is the one who decides whether or not you're free and, you know, like... Um, you know, we all have liberty as humans. We all have human rights. The government isn't who gives you your rights. We do not derive our right. You know, a lot of people say, oh, like, oh well, we have the right to, to keep and bear arms because the Constitution says so. No. You have the right to keep and bear arms because you have the God-given right to defend yourself and to defend your family. You have the right to defend yourself against aggressors, against people coming to attack you. It has nothing to do with those words written down on some piece of paper that was written a couple hundred years ago. It has nothing to do with that. They enumerated some things, the people who were, who were devising how the government was going to be laid out, because they know how governments get. They know how oppressive governments can be. So all they try to do is safeguard some very core, very core rights that are inherent to us as human beings, as, as creatures created by our God, that God has given to us. And it's important for people to understand this because... You can, if you start relying on some government document somewhere for your for what your rights are, they can do away with that. It's just it's 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 imagination. It's a figment. But if you know solidly the, the rights that God has given to you, no one can take that away from you. If you have that understanding, then you shouldn't let anybody. I don't care what the laws are, what the rules are. God has given you these certain rights to be able to 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 live to go out and preach the gospel. I mean, if the law says that there's you know. You can't go out and go knocking on doors and go soul winning. Guess what? I'm going to do exactly that. Because I'm not going to break God's law. God has told us that he's commanded us to do it. I don't care what this government says or what they think or what they do or what they're going to threaten to do. And there needs to be a lot more people with that type of an attitude. Because when, when, um, when you don't stand up for your rights, when you don't stand up for yourself, when you don't assert your rights... The bullies are going to come and try to take that away from you. The oppressors, those that just, just love controlling people and being in charge of people who aspire to actually be in the government, to tell other people what to do with their lives and to control everything about them, they're going to come in and they're going to take and they're going to take and they're going to slowly just push and push and push and push and push. And if you just let yourself get pushed around all the time, guess what? They're going to keep on pushing and they're going to push even harder. No. It's never going to stop. The bully never stops picking on you until you stand up for yourself. And when the government becomes oppressive, and when your rights start being eroded and taken away, it's time to stand up and say no, and assert yourself. But unfortunately, today we have a lot of people, they don't even value their own freedom. They don't value their own privacy. They don't value these things that are important to us. And people just become complacent, and they don't even care. They just, they, they're so shallow-minded, they think like, well, I've got a house and a couple of cars, I'm doing fine for myself, so whatever. You want to come in, you want to search me, you want to read all my emails, you want to do all this stuff, well, I don't care, I've got nothing to hide. And they say that, and they say that, and they let all these things get out of control, until when the, when the, when the tyranny really comes and just smacks you in the face... There's nothing you're going to be able to do about it because you've let everything slide to the point to where there's nothing else for you to do and, and the power structure has already been established to where you can't even fight anymore. Too few people are willing to make a stand and fight or even just to speak up about it and speak out about it. Many people are afraid of the confrontation. People don't like, you know, oh, you know, the, there's the, the, the rules. Don't ever talk about religion or politics. Yeah, because those are the things that matter. And we've been brainwashed in this society to never talk about those things that are the most important things. Yeah, we should all just sit around and talk about the weather. That's what we should do for the rest of our lives. And then at the end of our lives, we can look back and see you've accomplished nothing. You didn't stand for right. You just did absolutely nothing. You just let your life just slip away and, and you did nothing with it. Instead of doing something with your time and influencing people about things that really matter. People are like, oh, but it's so divisive issue like abortion or whatever, you know, um, you know, gay marriage or whatever. These things people are so divisive about, I just don't even want to talk about it. 
don't don't have that kind of an attitude. You need to stand up and preach what's right. And it's not always going to be an easy thing to do. It's not always comfortable to do, but it's something that you need to do. And, you know, again, many people are just so focused on their own personal short-term well-being that they don't even see the big picture. And, and, and it is, it's truly a selfish society where we don't, you, do, you can't see past your own, your own hand. And people can't see into the future. They don't think about their children or their grandchildren or the next generations that are to come. They only think about their own stinking comfort and, oh, well, I don't want to deal with that. Oh, that's, that sounds like work. Or, you know, I don't, I don't like confrontation. So they're just going to, you know, these bad people are just going to keep doing what they want anyways. That's the attitude they want you to have. You need to stand up to the oppression and stand up to the oppressors and don't let you have to stop them. Because that's what the Bible says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. But guess what? If you don't resist him, he's going to keep coming and keep coming and keep coming and make your life worse and worse and get you more wrapped up in sin. You have to stand up and resist him. Stand up and resist him and he'll flee from you. All oppression, all tyranny, you need to stand up and resist and push back and say, no, you're not going to take my freedom. No, you're not going to take my liberty. I'm not going to allow it. You've gone too far. <coughs> Verse 38 says, and the sergeants told these words unto the magistrates and they feared when they heard that they were Romans. So this is a lot closer to the attitude that our government ought to have and the way it used to have where the, the government officials are afraid of the people, of the citizenry. They should be the ones fearing us. When the people fear the government, that's when you have tyranny. When you're afraid of what the government's going to do to you, when you're afraid that the government might say, I can't homeschool my children, I can't teach them, they're going to come and take them away from me, they're going to come and do all these things, they're going to come and throw me into jail, that's tyranny. You don't have freedom. It needs to be the other way around. It needs to be, no, we have our rights. I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm not going to go hurt anyone else. I'm not going to be a criminal and commit crimes against other people. But I'm going to teach my children the way I want to teach them. I'm going to practice my religion the way I want to practice it. I'm going to preach the gospel. I'm going to preach the truth. I don't care if it offends people. I don't care if people get upset. I'm going to preach what's right. And there's nothing you can do about it. And they are the ones that ought to be fearful of that instead of, instead of the people being fear of the government. And, um, and that's exactly what Paul, he said, look, no. He, now, he could have just walked away and left, right? I mean, they sent him. He was free to go, right? The powers that be said, you're free to go. Go on, get out of here. Paul said, no. Why don't you come down here yourself and get me out of here? You beat me uncondemned publicly in front of everybody. You just whipped me and beat me. I didn't do anything wrong. Come down to yourselves and get me out of here. They were afraid when they heard that. They were afraid. He said, look, I'm a Roman citizen. Because that meant something to them. Being a Roman citizen meant something to them. Now, it shouldn't have mattered whether he's a Roman citizen or not. He's a human being. You don't treat people like that. I don't care who you, I don't care in this country. And again, people are so backwards in this country too to think that, oh, well, if you're not from the United States, then you don't have the same rights that we have. If you're coming and visiting from Saudi Arabia and you got some towel on your head, you're going to say, oh, we well, don't have the same rights that we have here, even though they might be living here. It's just ignorance. No, that person has just as much rights as you do because God gave all of us rights. It doesn't, it's not the government has given you these rights. And you need to treat people the same way. I mean, that's why we don't torture, that's why we're not supposed to be torturing our prisoners and doing things like that because they're human beings. We don't do certain things. You treat people um, the way that they ought to be, the way that God said that you need to treat people. And um, anyways, we're going to close with that. Uh, I think there's like one more verse left here in verse 39. It says, and they came and besought them and brought them out and desired them to the power of the So they actually come. And they take them out and say, okay, look, why don't you guys just go? They're like, please, just get out of our city. You know? And that's what they do. It says, and they went out of the prison and entered in the house of Lydia. Lydia was a lady that they met down by the, by the river where they were praying. And when they had seen the brethren, they comforted them and departed. Well, let's bow our heads on word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for the Bible. 
Lord, I pray that you would please give us all the boldness that Paul had um, and the spirit that, that, that Paul and Silas had to, when bad times happen, when things come, to be able to rejoice and to sing praises and to pray to you, dear God, and um, that we would be able to see great miracles at your hand. And I pray that you would please use us mightily. Give us the courage to stand up against oppression and against tyranny in whatever form it comes in you. God, give us the, the strength to stand up against the devil, that we're not ignorant of his devices. And I pray that you would please just help us to, to, to not allow the, the wicked people, the God-haters that are pushing their wicked agenda, their anti-God agenda. Dear God, I pray that you would please help us not to be silent, but to, but to fight back and to, and to be vocal. And, and not allow them to get their way, dear Lord, that their God-hating ways, that we would just, as Christians, find our voices and stand up and be able to speak out. And hey, maybe we could influence other people too if we're not so afraid to talk about things at the dinner table or when guests come over, relatives. Lord, help us to be able to be an influence, a positive influence, a godly influence on other people instead of ignoring the important things and just talking about the weather. Lord, I pray that you would please strengthen this church. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen.